As Eric said earlier, we're wrapping up our series called Unleashed that we've kind of learned together about how God has given us gifts that we want to unleash to others. Um, and if you were here at the start of our series, we actually gave out some gifts to just one person per service. And now we have the opportunity to see how those people have taken those gifts and have passed those gifts on to others. So let's take a look. Well, my name is Julie Kamazovich, and I received the gift at the Saturday evening service, and it uh, contained a $100 bill. And when I was told what I was supposed to do with it, a lot of things went through my mind, including various agencies that I have donated to in the past, but I wasn't excited about it. I wanted to give it to an individual instead of an organization and I just had a really hard time uh, trying to figure out who that individual would be. I was looking uh, far away from myself, wondering how I would meet this person. And um, so I prayed about it and asked that it would become obvious to me who I should give it to. I ended up having a conversation with my husband about my coworker being on maternity leave and how I missed her and it just hit me like a brick. I knew that I wanted to give it to her she had gone through four years of infertility and had quite a infertility loan, so I gave it to her to uh, put towards that. And let's uh, firm Julie for doing a great deal. Okay, yeah. That's good. Well, as I was saying, we're, we've been in this series called Unleashed. It was only going to run three weeks, and uh, then we're going to be done with it, and then we just really sensed this desire to push it out a little bit. So we talked about what it means to certainly be unleashed at, at work and what it means to be unleashed at your home. Regina and Gordon did a great job last week on, released, on, on being unleashed at home. And matter of fact, I was thinking about the work issue. I was at Panera this week having lunch with one of our elders and we were sitting outside in the patio area. And I turned around and I, I saw one of our pathway attenders uh, that was there and she had her unleashed shirt on, her scrubs on. And I thought, she gets it. She's taking this whole deal right to work and realizing that uh, God has given her a job to do, but also an opportunity to serve the Lord within the context of it. And so this week, I want to talk about what it means to be unleashed to live. And what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about money. And I don't know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking to myself, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, Ron, you know, I'm baptism Sunday. Like, I, I invited my whole family to church this Sunday, or I've been working on my spouse for a long time to get them here, and, and, uh, and, and they've been saying, I don't want to come because all the church does is talk about money. And you've been saying, no, they don't really ever talk about money. Well, you came the wrong Sunday because we're going to talk about money. <laughs> and uh, come next week, we're going to talk about kids. We're going to move into a new series called Edge, talk about kids, about how they take your money. And, uh, and so if you want to see that, you can do that as well. But I'm not, it's not going to be painful. Uh, trust me, it won't be painful, but it's one of those moments when, when you think about being unleashed, really the issue of our resources, it's, it's just an important uh, conversation that we need to have with one another as well. And so the big idea this morning is this, and that is that uh, how you manage your wealth reveals what, what your heart is truly, truly leashed to. How, what, uh, how you manage your wealth reveals what your heart is truly leashed to. And the fact is, is that as Americans, we're wealthy. When you look at, at the, the context of what we have been given and what we've been provided with within, the, within, our, within our land and the freedom of our land, but also the resources that are here, and you look at the rest of the world, the fact is that you're, well, you're wealthy. It doesn't matter if you're on the, the lower end or on the upper end. Uh, God has entrusted you with a tremendous amount of wealth, and God's Word says a lot to us about this issue of, of what we do with our finances. And as we've been walking through Unleashed, we happen to land in the book of Ephesians, and there's, there's nothing in the book of Ephesians that talks about this issue of, of money. But it is found in the book of 1 Timothy. And Paul writes to young Timothy instructions as to how he is going to be leading the church in Ephesus. And, uh, and one of the things that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy is he talks about the fact that, that, that young Timothy, you're going to be going to this church, you're going to be leading these people, and Ephesus was a... Was a, was a community where there was a tremendous amount of wealth and a tremendous amount of freedom to gain more wealth. And, uh, and so he knew that there were going to be people within his church that he was going to be leading that had wealth. And he said, I, I want you to, to, to just make certain that you're mindful of how you're going to lead them as it relates to that. And so this is what he says in verses 17 through 19. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. 
In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, Paul does not, he does not condemn anyone for being wealthy, uh, nor does he tell those who are wealthy to give everything away, uh, nor does he tell the folks, hey, listen, Tim, when you go into this community, you need to tell everyone there to take the vow of poverty and, uh, and to live that way. He doesn't say that at all. But what he does is he lays the framework for what not to do and what to do with your wealth. And there's four things that, that I found this past week as I, as I studied this, this passage of Scripture. There are four things that, that came out to my attention that I just want to share with you this morning just very brief, briefly. The first is this, and that is that Paul tells us basically, put your hope in what is certain. Put your hope in what is certain. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. He says, listen, when it comes to your money, if that's what you're going to put your hope in, you need to understand it's, it's uncertain. Uh, it's not going to provide you with a sense of certainty. But in the midst of all the uncertain times in which you live in, and they were living uncertain times back then, just as we're living in uncertain times today, he's saying make certain that you put your focus on that which is certain, and that is, that is God and, and God himself. And, and yet what we know about money is we know that money comes and money goes. As a matter of fact, Scripture is full of principles as, as it relates to this issue of money. Proverbs 23.5 says, your money can be gone in a flash as, is, as if it had grown wings and flown away like an eagle. Anybody ever feel like that? that? Like, where did it all go? You know, you get your paycheck on Friday, and by Friday night you're going, where did it all go? I mean, how did, did it grow wings and just fly away at that point? And, and then you end up having conversations and arguments about your money and whatever else. It gets you in all sorts of trouble. But when it comes to, to life in and of itself, what we need to know is this. We need to know that life is made up of chances and changes. We, we, we have chances that come into our life, chance things may, might work out, chance things may not work out. We decide with our money, we're going we're to invest our money into the market, and we think, man, the market's going to, it's in a good place, and it's going to keep on going. Chances are it's not going to keep on going that direction. It may end up going, it's going to end up going this direction at some point, and we end up with this element of changes. I mean, we all face changes. We face changes as it relates to our our, our financial situation, we face changes as it relates to our jobs, we face changes as it relates to our relationships, we face changes as it relates to our physical health and, 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 uh, and all that comes into play there. And the fact is that you can be wealthy today, but you can find yourself in poverty tomorrow. And there's certain reasons for that. Some, it may be situational. And that is that, that maybe you do lose that job, and, and after a while you start to see that savings dwindle down to almost nothing, and you're thinking to yourself, now I find myself at a place where... I'm experiencing a level of poverty unlike I've ever experienced before. Maybe it has to do with a health issue. You go to the doctor and everything's going great and then you get that diagnosis and that diagnosis does something to you and you realize this is going to cost me every penny that I have. It's nothing you did wrong. It's just situational. For some, it may be generational. And that is that you've been passed from one generation to the next this line of poverty. It's called generational poverty. And, and many suffer with this, this issue, and that is that they can never get out of what has been handed to them time and time and time and time again from one generation to the next generation. And so you face this issue of generational poverty. Maybe for some of you it's, it's habitual. That is that you find yourself living above your means, not just a little bit, but all the time. And, uh, and you find yourself buying things that you really can't afford all the time, and it's an issue of being habitual, or it's just an issue of just, just self-discipline. You do not show the discipline or have the discipline that's needed to manage your money in a God-honoring way. Matter of fact, 76% of Americans live paycheck by pay to paycheck. The average American spends about $1.30 for every dollar they earn. 95% of married couples fight about money. How many of you who are married have ever fought about money? Yeah, and the rest of you didn't raise your hand. You're lying. Um, <laughs> Uh, 80% of divorced people indicate financial issues played a primary role in their marriage, 80%. And that is that really the issue is communication of not how, having a good plan that they've communicated with each other and expectations along the way, but it plays a, it plays a, huge, a huge role in the issue of the breakdown of, of the marriage as well. I mean, this issue of, of money is a big deal. Matter of fact, I, I heard a true story about a, a dad, his son, had, you know, coming out of Sunday school and and uh, they were heading home, and so as always, they talked about the message. They talked about the, what, what he learned in class on the way home. And 
And so he asked his son, so what'd you learn about today? And he says, well, we learned about uh, you can't serve two masters. And it kind of made the dad smile. And he realized clearly that morning in that class, they were studying Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and, be, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so he said, I was so impressed with what he learned uh, that I thought our conversation would just kind of move on. But uh, I sat there for a moment, and then the son asked the dad, he said, hey, dad, do you know what a master is? And intrigued, uh, the dad just kind of stopped for a moment, and he wondered, and he says, no, who's, who's the master? He says, it's owner, whoever owns you. And so really when it comes to the issue of how we manage our resources, the question is, who owns you or what owns you? It's really not whose money is it, but who owns you? Where do you put your hope? You put your hope in what you have, or you put your hope in the one who gives you everything that you have? There's the difference. I think the second thing Paul says is embrace God's generosity to you. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Does it say that, that God is up there and he's saying, I'm going I'm to I'm give them all this stuff, but I'm going to take it all back away because I don't want them to have any fun? No, God has given you everything for your enjoyment, your family for your enjoyment, that job for your enjoyment, your resources for your enjoyment. He's saying, I want you to enjoy these things. I want you to enjoy those things. And so God has, has graciously and, and generously given you all that you have. And when you begin to understand that, realize it all comes from God, it changes your outlook on what you do possess, and you realize, wait a minute here, God is the one who's, who's, who's given this to me. God is the one who's given me this ability and, and these gifts, these talents, and, and, and these resources, and these people around me, and I want to manage those in a way that's going to be God-honoring. But there's also another expression of God's generosity that at times we often overlook that is actually the ultimate expression of his generosity. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 8 9, he says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. See, and listen, not only are those resources he's given to you, God-given, but the ultimate resource of your salvation that is found in Christ Jesus and Christ alone, that, that out of love God sent his son Jesus to go to that cross to pay that penalty for your sins. And when you acknowledge him as your Savior, he takes care of that sin issue in your life. He frees you. It's a, it's a full expression of his love, and it's freely given to you, and it's out of the heart of generosity that God has done that for you. You thankful for that this morning? Yeah, I'm so thankful for that this morning. And so when you translate that then into what else God has given to you, and you realize, wait a minute, not only has God graciously given me this gift of salvation, but he's also given me everything else I have, especially my resources, you begin to look at that differently as well. Matter of fact, two things you begin to do within your life. You move from an owner to a manager. You start looking at your resources not as what you have, but as what has been entrusted to you to manage. You realize God has given that to me, and it's just not mine to flounder with, not mine to throw to the wind, but he has given that to me with a sense of God-given responsibility Amen. to manage it and to manage it well. I'll tell you the other thing that happens is that when you realize that God has given it to you, you move from greed to generosity. God has given. God has given his son to us freely. You move from greed to generosity. You look at your resources and you realize, God has given this to me. Is, it, is he given it to me for, to hoard and just for me? No, he's given it to you, certainly for your enjoyment, but also to, to move your heart to becoming more generous, to live more like this. Uh, this past week, uh, Friday night, we had two of our staff members who, who got married, Kyle and Suzanne. It's kind of funny. Um, uh, we have a rule at, uh, at their offices, and that is that you're not supposed to fraternize with other staff members, but they fraternize with each other, and as a result, they got married Friday night. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, Kyle, he was uh, one of our, he was in our student ministries department, single guy, both single, and, uh, and Suzanne showed up for work one day, single gal, and, and uh, the story is, is that Kyle kind of rolled his seat out to the door and kind of looked and thought, hmm, you know. And one thing led to another, and so they got married for a night. So I guess the, the moral of the story is if you're single, come get a job at Pathway, and we'll find you a mate <laughs> is what we'll do. So, so anyway, uh, this is the first wedding I've gone to that I had to, I had to write the check for the gift. You know, I mean, we went to Target. I'm thinking, I don't want to get them something at Target. 
you know, and so I'll just give them the money. I mean, I, I can remember when Laura and I got married. I mean, the biggest deal for us was going to that hotel room and pouring that box of envelopes down top of that bed and counting cash. That's the first thing we did. <laughs> Seriously, it's the first thing we did. It was all about the money is what it was. <laughs> Moved to other things later, but right then it was all about the money. And it didn't take long, trust me. But anyway, oh, sorry about that. Sorry, kids. Sorry. Anyway, so... So, the wet, so anyway, so I'm writing the check for the wedding. Well, the deal is that Laura never bought a, she never bought a card for anyone. She would never buy a, a wedding card. She never bought a birthday card. What she would do is she would write the check for like $53.50. She'd say $50 is for your wedding gift and $350 is for the card that I didn't buy <laughs> to put the wedding gift in. So enjoy that. And so uh, I got ready to write the check. And so I wrote the check and I wrote it. And Dawson was in the kitchen. I said, hey, I said, do you think this is, do you think this is enough? Do you think this is, a, this is a fair gift? He said, come on, Dad. Said, They're on your staff. I mean, I mean, you make plenty of money. I was thinking 10 bucks was enough, you know, but uh, so I wrestled with it a little bit. I wrote it for $18.50, $15 for you and $3.50 for the card. No, I didn't. I, I gave him 20 bucks. Uh, but anyway, no. But, but it was that moment where I thought, yeah, I need, yeah, it felt good to be generous. And you know what? I didn't miss it one bit. Not one bit. Just an opportunity just to be a, a little generous. They may not think it's that generous, but I thought it was pretty generous. Uh, but when you think about the generosity and the generosity of God, uh, one, uh, one individual here that, that uh, I was having a conversation with sent me a little note. He says, hey, Ron, when you talk about generosity, talk about it this way. He says, generosity isn't about just giving more. It's about reflecting the heart of a God who gives so much for us. When we are generous, we live in sync with our Creator the way we were meant to. Generosity doesn't earn us favor with God or fulfill some type of necessary command. And the lack of generosity doesn't give us a ding on God's scorecard. When anything comes between us and generous living, it really messes with our God-given design. We aren't living as God is and who we are designed to be. If you want a full life, you need to address what is keeping you away from a heart of generosity. God designed each of us to reflect His generosity. So when God is generous... With those relationships, when God is generous with that work, when God is generous with those gifts, when God is generous with those abilities, he says, unleash those. When God is generous with resources, unleash those. And as a result of unleashing those, you discover an incredible sense of freedom and joy. Here's AJ's story. Uh, my name's AJ Hummer, uh, and I was the recent recipient of a $150 gift. I decided to use my money to help some kids in need to go to a uh, University of Auburn wheelchair basketball camp. Uh, it's one of my top options going into college, uh, wheelchair basketball, and um, I really want to help their program grow um, and build them up to what they could be um, and what they could become. Uh, I've been playing wheelchair basketball for 11 years and it's been great for me. Um, it's one of my true passions. Uh, it's really, I, I've really seen a lot of help with um, like different scholarships I've gotten. Um, financially, it's very expensive to go to camps between travel and, and the cost of, of camps. And so I thought if I could help kids just pay for a little bit of that, um, it helped them a lot as it's helped me. Um, because I know in my, in my own personal life, uh, this sport means a lot to me. And it's taken me to places I've never thought I'd go before, um, including college basketball. Um, and I'd really like to help some other kids out, and so I think I can do just that. Um, and it was just the right amount, so I could help about three or four kids out. That's a great story, too. I'm going to find that. And, uh, you know, it's, I've, been to, I've been to one of AJ's basketball games. He plays basketball with his brother Isaac. If you remember, a few weeks ago, we were praying for the young man that was having brain surgery down at Riley, having a difficult time. That's his brother Isaac. Uh, his... Uh, they're triplets. His, his sister, Kendra, is also wheelchair-bound, and um, they come here on Saturday nights usually, and when you, when you see Kendra and Isaac and AJ, you, say, you see a tremendous sense of joy that just pours out of, out of just their expressions and who they are, and, and uh, it was just so awesome when I found out AJ got that gift. I thought, man, that's a, that's a great individual to give that gift to, and he, he managed that gift really well. The third is this, and that is that God calls us to unleash the heart of God through your generosity. He says, put your hope in what is certain, embrace God's certainty to you, and unleash the heart of God through your generosity. Verse 18 says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Paul tells us, 
He tells those with wealth to release it for good, to share it, to leverage it. He says, unleash it. And when you do something, and something is unleashed in you and, and through you, that when I embrace God's generosity to me, and then I respond with generous spirit, I end up unleashing the heart of God through me. And, and Scripture is full of those principles, again, for, for dealing with, with the issue of our wealth. Matter of fact, uh, Scripture, about 500 verses on prayer, about 500 verses on faith, about 2,350 verses on the issue of, of your wealth and, and money. Very important thing. Proverbs 3, 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord your God with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Uh, Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And yet, so oftentimes, we resist this issue of generosity, and we resist it because of what we're leashed to, of what we're leashed to. We're leashed to our commitments. We spend too much time, and we spend on too many things without even thinking about why, and we remove any of the margins that we have to be generous. We remove all the margins because we're so caught up with what we owe. So you, you go and you, you buy that new truck because you're going to look good in that new truck, and, uh, and you sign the papers for that new truck, and you pull that truck off the lot, and it's just depreciated, I don't know how many percent, the minute you pull that thing off the lot, you don't even think about that. Get the truck home, you enjoy it for your first month because you don't have to make the first month payment. And the next month, you pull that payment book out, and you stick it on top of your desk, and you pull the first one out, and you're thinking to yourself, I got 60 more of these to go. Man. And then not only that, you got to pull out the next book because, you know, it's the book for your house, and so you're making that deal, and then you're dealing with the credit card issues that you're having to contend with and kind of balance your way through and manage your way through that thing. And all the stuff that you put your focus on is now creating a tremendous amount of anxiety and no margin. No margin to freely live. You find yourself consumed with your possessions, your desires, because the fact is that when it comes to your desires... You see something that you want, and you think to yourself, man, I, I really want that. I really want that. And then eventually the want turns to a need. I need that. And then you get that, and again, you've invited more anxiety into your life. Or maybe it has to do with your conventions. <laughs> what do I mean by conventions? It has to do with the fact that you just simply don't know how to manage it because you've never learned how. And some of you are here now, and your, your resources are managing you, and it's managing, managing your emotions, it's, it's managing how you're getting through your week, it's managing how you're walking to your mailbox, and how you're opening it up, and how you're hoping something's not in there that you're, you know is going to be in there, and, and it's, it's just, it's messing with you, and you just, you don't know how. Can I just tell you that around here, we really are concerned about how people manage their resources, because these are God-given resources, and Matter of fact, if you go to our home site, homepage, uh, pccfw.org, and the bottom right, right area of the, of, the, of the open page there has a, has a little, little box that says events in it. You punch on events, and then you scroll down a little bit. On June 22nd, we start our next class of Financial Peace University. And I would encourage you to jump into that class. If, you, if, you're, if you're not managing your resources in a way that is giving you freedom, jump into that class. And as you jump into that class, you're going to begin to realize, I can put together a plan, and I can actually live with a sense of freedom with the resources that God has given to me. Sometimes you just need a plan. You know, for those men who've been a part of Mandate Monday, you know this, give, save, and live through, Andy Stanley shares that. Laura and I have lived on, we lived on that for, for our, our married life. Matter of fact, when the giving piece was there, um, we were both doing giving before we got married, so the giving wasn't even an issue. Uh, and it was give, save, live. Give, save, live. Say that with me. Give, save, live. Again, give, save, live. Yeah, so we lived on the giving. And, and we lived on the giving that for us it was percentage giving and, you know, 10% right off the top of what we get. We said, hey, we're going to give that. And we never argued about that. You know what our argument was around? Our argument was around how much she wanted to give and how much I wanted to give. And typically the argument was this. I'm going like, hey, Laura, I think we ought to give just this much. And Laura's like, no, I think we ought to give this much. I'm thinking, you just want to give it all away, don't you? Yeah, just give it all away. No, I don't want to give it all away. And, uh, and so I want, to, I want to live a little bit, you know? But it was give, and then it was save. Always saved. And then it was live. With our kids, they got, an, they got uh, um, allowances, you know? And, and hey, you're going to give, you're going to save, and you're going to live. 
And, and for some of you, you're thinking to yourself, but man, if I think about 10, 10, 80, 10% giving, 10% saving, 80% living, man, 10%, that's a lot. I, I don't know how I would do that. I mean, that'd be a lot. Of, then this is what I'd encourage you to do. Instead of thinking about that 10% piece, begin thinking just about percentage giving. If you're not giving anything right now, chances are you're not going to move to a high percentage of giving next week. But if you could start looking at the fact that God has given me these resources, say, you know what? Maybe it's going to be 1%, or maybe it's going to be 2%. It's going to be remarkable what will happen for that as a result of that. What? what you, oh, Nelson's chicken. Okay, so the youth are sell, selling Nelson's chicken. Here's the way you can give. Yeah, it <laughs> smells good, and as you leave, they're going on a mission trip to Haiti. Thanks for that, you guys. Appreciate that. I'm not going to pay you for that, but I'll eat it. No, just kidding. But give, save, and live. When I was thinking about just for us in our 22 years of marriage and just thinking about how we, how we handled our money and how we handled generosity as it related to our money, we never sat down and really laid down values, but I realized after a while as I was thinking about this message that we had some values. And uh, we really had four values. There may have been more than this, but one of them, kind of our rule for generosity was is that we never, we never took a free meal. Anytime we went to a restaurant, when we got ready to leave that restaurant, we always, we always tipped well. We always tipped well. And it didn't matter the service. We just always tipped well. Because who knows? This gal or this guy could be having a bad day. So we're just going to tip well. Every time we've gone to a, a banquet, whether it be a Youth for Christ banquet, a Rescue Mission banquet, Kara's House banquet, Hope Center banquet, um, a YFC banquet, a, uh, um, a City Life banquet, any time we've walked into a banquet... We've never taken a free meal. Every time we've walked in, we've walked in saying, we are here just simply not to hear, but we're here because we want to be a partner with what they're doing. <laughs> and we just gave. We always partnered with those that were very Jesus-focused. That is, there's a lot of other organizations that are out there, and those get taken care of, but we've always said our heart is for the kingdom. Our heart is for doing Jesus' work, and so therefore... As we gave, we gave towards those things that were very Jesus-focused. I mean, this is, this is a great one. To send a kid to Haiti, for them to get their heart expanded a little bit in Haiti, makes a huge difference on that end. And we always would be able to share Jesus through our giving. I know that in the last few months of Laura's life, so many of you, you, sh you gave to us. And, and it was an expression of, of just God's love to us and the Lord's love to us and and, and there, are, there are those moments when we get to give and we get to give generously. And, and sometimes when you give generously, somebody might say to you, why are you doing that? I don't understand why you did that. I'm doing that because God's been so good to us. And we just want to be good to others. And then we've always invested in our church. Always. Always. And there have been times, I need to tell you this, there have been seasons in the life of this church. We'll celebrate Sweet, sweet 16 next year. There have been seasons in the life of this church when we've not been happy with this church. And I'm on staff. There have been seasons when we've struggled and we've been wrestling, but it's never stopped us from being faithful to where God has called us. We've always looked and said, we'll get through this season. We're going to be faithful to what God has called us to. And, and it's not about what we're getting today. It has everything to do as well with the future where we're going as a church because the reality is, the reality is I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be here forever. There's going to be a moment where I'm going to be gone. And, and so as, as I look at that, I think to myself, well, I, it's not about me being here forever. I won't be here forever. It's about this church and about the legacy and the impact and, and continue to have the stories like these and the multiple other stories through the course of this weekend of individuals who, who come to faith in Christ or life is being changed. I mean, come on. A guy who's an atheist turns his life over to Jesus. Is that not worth the investment? <laughs> worth the investment. Marriage restored, I and mean, someone who's given new hope in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their addiction. I mean, it is, it is what we're all about around here. And so uh, we've always invested in our church. You know, every month we give you a little, just a little grade card on where we're at with Beyond and um, as we're moving towards this issue of, of even our build. And, and I want to tell you, so many of you stepped into this thing. 2,508 donors, people have, have, donate, have, have been a part, not donated, but you've played a part in where is the church, and so our general operating is right on track, and as it relates to the build component of it, we've been able to put aside another one point, you know, one one million nine hundred twelve thousand six hundred three three dollars for the build component, in order for us to break ground. 
We're about a million, right at a million short on that to break ground. And when you think about these, these individuals that stepped in, I hate the word donors, but really ministry partners is what we have here. Uh, stakeholders is what, is what that really should be, 2,508 stakeholders. If we all did a little extra above what we normally give, this is all we'd have to do. Just $433.56 from everyone who would say, I'm going to give that extra to where we're going. We'd be able to break ground probably by the end of summer. And again, it's for the future where we're going. And when God, when God gives and when you live this way, you enjoy this incredible sense of freedom as a result of it. When you manage your resources in the way that God would say, manage your resources, be God-honoring. Give to the work that God has called you to. Here's Mark Etter's story. My name is Mark Etter. I've been attending Pathway now for about seven years. Um, and I was a recipient of one of the gifts a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so inside of this gift, there was uh, two $100 bills. And one of the things that the pastor asked is, you know, to give those away or do whatever you would like with that, but just so it could follow up. So here I am. Uh, what I decided to do with that gift was to give it to a friend's wife. Uh, I had just recently talked to my friend. He had, his wife had a brother that had passed away and I hadn't had the courage to call and see how she was doing yet. Uh, so when I talked to him and kind of heard what the family's going through and it's been kind of difficult, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I gave the money to my friend's wife. But what I really wanted to do was teach my daughter, who's seven, uh, how to live life with her hands open and not closed. And really, in essence, trying to teach her, it's more fun to give than to receive. And that was really important to me. Um, so when we had discussed what I wanted to do with it, my daughter wanted to give $100 in her service up in Kid City. So uh, I had to talk her into my plan, which took a while, but I told her I would make a deal with her to give some extra to the, her service in the, in the tithing uh, offering. So it was really important for me to teach her that it's more fun to give than to receive. And I think it was a lesson that was well learned. My name is Michelle Vince and I'm a recipient of one of the gifts that was passed around a couple weeks ago. Um, I was at the nine o'clock service and I just thought that was a really neat idea to be able to give a gift to somebody in need, even though the gift is intended to be um, for other people, it comes back to the gift giver I know. Um, I was touched at the nine o'clock service, um, recently lost my brother to cancer um, in, in March, and there were so many people that stepped up and supported my sister-in-law and their three girls. Um, very young girls and um, lost a significant member of their family. So when the gift was passed around, I just I was reflecting and thought, what a generous way to show somebody that you care. And didn't think much of it after that. A week later, um, I was coming home after uh, track practice and there were two cars pulling out of my driveway. One was my husband leaving to go to a meeting and the other one was a car I didn't recognize until I got closer. And it was a friend and our financial advisor, um, Mark Etter. And he just quickly rolled down his window and told us that um, there was a, something on the step inside the garage for us and he pulled away. Um, he usually comes by every once in a while for us to sign paperwork, but this was not paperwork that we usually signed. It was a card, and I took it inside and opened it, and in it he wrote that he was asked by his pastor at church to pass around a gift, and at the end of the service, he happened to be the recipient of the gift, and he was told to open it, and the money was there, um, and he was supposed to give it to somebody. Um, he gift he gifted the money to my sister-in-law and their three kids. Um, doesn't know them, has never met them, um, and that was just a really touching experience to be involved with. Um, he didn't have to do that, and um, our family was very touched by his generosity and his thoughtfulness and kindness. So that's how the gift has 
affected me um, and my family and certainly my sister-in-law and their three little girls. And that's a great story. Yeah, it's a great story. Sure. Last is this, and that's, you know, not only do you put your hope in what is certain, embrace God's generosity, you unleash the heart of God through your generosity, but the fourth is just leash yourself to Jesus. Verse, six, verse 19 of chapter 6 says, In this way they will lay up for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so they may take hold of life that is truly life. It's interesting, in, in John 10, when Jesus was giving instructions to his disciples, he said, listen, the thief is going to come to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's going to use whatever means he can to do just that. And he's going to, he's going to uh, move you into a, a mode of temptation. He's going to try to destroy your faith. He's going to try to get you to question God's goodness within your life. He's going to use what I've given for good to get a hold of your heart and to cause you to close your hands and not to live in a way that is free. And Jesus says, but listen, if you'll follow, if you'll follow me and if you'll follow after what my word says and if you'll live according to it, which includes your resources, you will experience a life that is full and free. And when you, when you begin to just take the step to, to say yes to Jesus, he begins to work into your life and mess you up a little bit, but he begins to, to change your thinking as it relates to everything that you've been given. Not only your salvation, but your relationships, your family, your job, your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your resources. And you begin to see them as an extension of God's generosity to you, and you begin to live this way and not this way. Let's stand together. I know some of you are, are thinking, well, wait a minute, Ron, there was one more story. I mean, there's, there were only three stories or four gifts that were given, and one individual got the gift of 150, and he decided he would multiply it to give it back to uh, our Beyond campaign, and so he multiplied that 150 by one, to $1.5 million. That is a lie. didn't happen at all, but I uh, thought I'd share that with you, but he did multiply it, and that was kind of a cool thing. Let's pray together. Lord, thanks so much for, for this day. Thanks, Lord, for the gift of life change and those 14 testimonies that I got to hear this weekend of individuals that have come to know you in a profound way and their lives have been radically changed by your grace. And we get to be a part of that as a church. We get to be a part of those stories and of walking with those individuals into a, a deeper understanding of what it means to walk in the fullness and freedom of life that you've given to them. We're just grateful we get to be a part of that. Thanks for our church. Thanks for what you're doing in our church and, and this gift you've given to us. We want to we wanna manage it well. And Lord, I just thank you for these folks that are here today. I'm thankful for the fact that, uh, that Lord, you've entrusted them with so much and you've given them so much. And I pray that as we leave this place today, we leave this place more aware that all that we have been given is not because of what we've done, but it's been because of what you've done for us. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. We'll see you later.